Welcome everybody to the Full Scale Outdoors podcast. I am your host, Dale Luganbill. Thanks for uh, thanks for joining me. Thanks for downloading. I was gonna say tune in, but it's not a radio, so you can't really tune in. But thanks for listening. How about that? We'll just keep that simple. On today's podcast, we're talking fly fishing, and uh, this this uh, this episode kind of just came about by chance. Not entirely by chance, but I took a little New England vacation, and uh, we covered all six states of New England, which would be, what, Massachusetts, Maine, Vermont, Connecticut, and Rhode Island. I think that's all of them. Yeah, I mean, it kind of made a big loop. But we stayed a couple nights in the White Mountains of New Hampshire in Conway, and uh, I just, I was like, well, this isn't really an outdoors, you know, this isn't a fishing destination vacation or whatever for me. It was an anniversary trip, but I thought, well, let's look. Did a little, little Google Googling there and found a North Country Angler, nice fly shop there in town. I thought, oh, let's see if anybody's around and wants to do a podcast. So I sent him a, a message, and by God, he agreed to do it. So it was awesome. I was I got to take a, a day. I trounced around their rivers out there, and I got to tell you, it is so gorgeous out there. I, the water was so clear, I couldn't believe it. Like, it just... As I was in it, I just kept remarking to myself, like, man, this water is so clear. And there still had snow out there with all the melt. I just kind of assumed that the the river would be, you know, a little dirtier. Water levels were a little high, but pff, nope. It was like aquarium clean water in there. Well, probably cleaner than that, all the aquariums that I've had in the past. But <laughs> anyways, uh, absolutely beautiful out there. You guys get a moment. Check it out. Uh, put New Hampshire on your list of areas to check out if you're into trout fishing and that because they have some giant browns out there 30 inches and uh i had no idea no idea whatsoever just kind of somehow that area of the country just never popped up on my radar but i'll tell you what it's on my radar now so anyways i sit down with uh steve angers i hope i'm saying that right of north country anglers uh it was great to sit down with him and talk we compared notes state to state notes and a lot of similarities between minnesota and new hampshire actually but then there's a lot of differences too so uh if you're a fly fisherman or you're a trout angler this is the episode for you so thanks for uh, downloading it let's get right to it this is the full scale outdoors podcast <laughs> Oh, here we go, boys. Go. Hey. Oh, I love that sound. This is a good one. I went up there. Well, that was the, what did you say? That was the Ellis? Ellis, yeah. Ellis yep. River I was at. Yeah, it was nice small stream, what you'd expect to see coming out of a mountain. That water is like crystal clear. Unbelievable. Even down here when I was fishing the, so what river would that be that I was Saco. at? Saco. Saco, that's right. And that water is just like crazy clear too. All the water is. It's cold. Yeah. Because I walked in it without waders. <laughs> well, it's probably uh, the Saco's up in the 40s now. Is it? For, for temperature. But those up in the Ellis where you were, yeah, I, I would be shocked if that thing isn't 40 yet. Yeah. Why? Well, well, there's snow everywhere on the banks of it. So I it's mean, just. Yeah. Yeah. But still, even though it's meltwater, it's still clean. I mean, it, I suppose running through that moss filters it all out and never. I mean, probably. I don't. Does it ever get chocolatey? Does it ever get blown out? No. The, only, the the Saco will because it runs through the farmland down here. Sure. So it starts picking up all the silt and everything. That makes but, sense. Uh, but any of those mountain streams like the Ellis, the only time that thing will get muddy is if we have, like, flood. So it comes up out of its banks and starts pulling crap. And then pulls and then goes back yeah. in. That makes sense. That makes sense. Are there any gold in these hills? Because there's a lot of pyrite, it looks uh, like. <laughs> you can see yeah, the sand, lots of but, sparkles in the sand. Yeah, but it's... Not real gold. Not, not worth it. Not, nobody goes up here and pans for it or nothing. No, and then um, Maine there back when gold was, what, 2000 bucks an ounce or whatever, there were some guys that were trying to do hydraulic, 
mining in the streams and that quickly got outlawed oh really yeah You're like nope yeah yeah what's the downfall of that why they well you're lie? basically vacuuming yep. everything off the bottom of the river oh so you're messing and up then the, the and the water goes one way and all the all the dirt goes up on the bank then they sift the the all the substrate they've yanked off the bottom and then they leave it oh so you're basically destroying the stream, the stream, stream, yeah. stream all the bottom. aquatic life in there i suppose is getting disrupted and yeah that wouldn't do very well for trout fishing I don't think that no, would help. Maine is like the last bastion of brook, of wild brook trout in the lower 48 states. So yeah, we're any, anything happens with the brook trout there, everybody starts getting their panties in a bunch. Yeah, well, you know, you kind of got it, or it's gonna it'll disappear. Somebody will move in. If there's a dollar to be made. Somebody will make a dollar out of it. <laughs> that's for sure. Huh. So how long this this is the. Uh, North Country Anglers, right? Is that where yep. we're at? Yep. How long have you been in business? Uh, the This store has been in business 50 years. Wow. And I'm the fifth owner. So, so every 10 years is yeah, a turnover? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody tries to make a career out of it. Like, you know what? I'm going to go back to fishing when I want to. Well, no. Actually, the first owner started Fly Tire Magazine. Really? And then the second owner took Fly Tire Magazine National and published a half dozen books. Then the third owner was a shop from down south that was trying to expand, and he didn't make it. So then one of the ladies that was working for him bought the shop from him. And she and her husband ran it for 15 years. Oh, well, they had a pretty good run. Until she passed away, and then I bought it. Huh. So. And that was how long ago? Two and a half years ago. Everything yeah. going great? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 It looks no, good. No, it's a nice no, little no. shop. Yeah, it's looking good. People seem to enjoy it. Well, Orvis, Sims, good quality stuff in here, it seems. Yep. Scott Rods, Winston Rods, Temple Fork. Yeah, I've been out of the fly fishing game for a while. I have no idea where my fly rod is, to be honest with you. Well, Temple Fork started as a fly rod company. They're getting into spin rods now, and they've got some great, great rods. And Temple Fork, because the fly fishing business is known for, you know, you break a rod, we'll replace it. Sure. They've gone into the spin business with the you break a rod, we'll replace it. Really? And they are just taking the spin business by storm mm. because nobody else does that. I'll have to look into it just because I, I like light spin tackle for not just trout but panfish. and It's a lot of fun. I like, you know, scaling down. But, yeah, I want to you know, the – those fly fishermen look down their nose at the spin casters. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like fly fishing. I really do. I just got out of it for whatever reason. And then always one of those things to say, I'm going to get back into it. And then, you know, you get swept up doing whatever. And then I got into tournament bass fishing. And then. Oh, since, really? Yeah. On a local level, just club tournaments and stuff like that. But With the bass boat and all that? Yeah. I went and got myself a ranger and. Spent, you know, spending more money than I need to. and <laughs> 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 Got to get more gear. This, you know, everything's gear heavy. It, it's what you want to put into it. But, um, well, hey. the, the cost to run a bass tournament in New Hampshire is very low. I think it's only like 50 bucks to run, to, oh, get, really? a, to, to get, get a permit, a, to get a permit to run a, run a tournament. So the lakes south of here, there's tournaments all summer like, long. How do they get yeah, smashed? All summer long. Is it, is bass fishing a big thing here in oh Russia, yeah is it? yeah yeah it's pretty big i haven't really looked too much at the map because when we kind of found a place to stay out here in the white mountains i was like oh check into the see if they got any trout out here and apparently they do i couldn't find any today <laughs> but it's kind of an interesting thing we'll have to, we talked about it a little bit we'll have to revisit it but so you have some what you call holdover fish right so right. kind of just explain how this whole thing gets set up well, the um, in the 1950s, when you know 
fish and game departments all over the country were putting every fish known to man and every piece of water known to man. Um, somebody decided to start putting brown trout in the Saco River, which was unfortunate because back then the Saco River held three and four pound brook trout. Oof, those it, good it, ones. it was like one of the native brook trout streams in New England. But, um, you know, they decided, well, let's throw a few browns in and see what happens. Oh, and they'll eat everything. <laughs> right. The brown, the browns took, <laughs> and then the browns, you know, started eating the brook trout. So the brook trout have had to kind of recede up into the into the tributary streams. Sure. Which is probably their, you know, they were probably already always there too, but that's where, you know, probably the young ones, you know. Right, all, all the all the spawning took place in those tributaries, right. but now you know they're they're not big enough for three pound fish to live in. Right. So the th three pound fish needed the bigger water right. to be able to hunt and eat and survive. The browns weren't having it, and the browns just <laughs> said, "Yeah, th this isn't going to happen." So, um, I mean, so over the years. The Saco River now has just turned into a trophy brown trout fishery and a, you know, stock trout park. You know, if you think of places in the Midwest where every Friday night or Saturday morning they release a bunch of trout and everybody lines up and go catches it, it's not that bad here. Not shoulder to shoulder, it's full not, contact. Right, right. But, um, you know, in the, I'm going to say, five or six miles of the Saco River, they put in 16,000 trout over the course of a fishing season. Wow. So there's always fish to catch, but, you know, they come out of the cement tank. Yeah, we have a few bodies of water like that in Minnesota. Um, well, they'll do a put, and, we call it a put and take. So they release fish for the purpose of people harvesting them. So there's usually no uh, length restrictions. I think we still have a five fish limit. Um, on certain on those bodies of water, and then there's some uh, ponds that they stock too, and the same thing. And, but they'll stock those multiple sizes, and they dump a bunch in in the winter time, and people will ice fish for them. They do that in the ponds up here. Yeah, people we, ice we fish for yeah. There's probably like twenty twenty five ponds in the state that our season ends October fifteenth, and right after that they'll go in and put in a bunch of fish in those twenty odd ponds, and then. Um, you can actually start ice fishing here as soon as you can get out on the ice. So sometimes it's our not season a calendar is, thing. It's just yeah, a, starts sometimes it starts at Thanksgiving. Sometimes it doesn't start till Christmas. Yeah, that's pretty similar to Minnesota, depending on where in Minnesota you're at and and the winter. I mean, I usually like to get out. I like to try to find ice that weekend after Thanksgiving. And some years I just got to go really far north to find it. <laughs> <laughs> and other years. Drive a wheeler out your back door. I mean, it's it all depends on how cold it gets and how fast. But yeah, so we kind of have the same thing in Minnesota with the stocking, and they're finding kind of the same thing. Those native brookies are really hard to find statewide. Minnesota is not really known as a destination fly fishing. You know, we got that driftless area in the southeast part of the state. And that's pretty good. There's some pretty good trout fishing down there. And then uh, up in the North Shore of Lake Superior, there's... Yeah, the coasters. Yep, we got... Uh, well, I think they had loopers. They call them Kamloops rainbows. And uh, I believe they stopped stocking those a few years back now. Boy, probably more than a few. We had a really hot summer, and, like, their pumps or something at the hatchery went down, and they lost, like, all of them, all the fry and they just said they weren't gonna well there's been trying to redo them so trout unlimited's done a ton of restoration work on those lake superior feeder streams because the uh, brook trout yeah yeah we got the nice brookies up there get five and six pounds i haven't found any like that but then i've heard that you really have to kind of bust some brush and get way back there off the beaten path to to find those big dogs but i have heard they're out there and we kind of, buddy of mine kind of found a stream on the map, no idea if there's trout in it or not, and it was way back on this, I mean, it's like less than a minimum maintenance road. Let's just go try it. And we went back there, and before he was finished 
rigging up, I already caught like five fish. I mean, it was just like a culvert going across this rough road, and man, they were just stacked in there. And we didn't catch any giant ones, but there's I could there's so many of them. I mean, it was just unbelievable. <laughs> Whatever you threw in there, they just destroyed. And there'd be like four or five of them all fighting for it. I mean, they just it was nuts. I, I've been meaning to get back there and just really kind of go plunge in deeper, but. The brush is so thick. The bugs were so bad. I mean, the mosquitoes and black flies, I mean, it was, I don't know if it was Alaska proportions, but I mean, I've never been there and experienced, but I hear it's pretty bad. But this was, I mean, you well, you stepped out of your car and it was instantly just, 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 we didn't have head nets, nothing. We just got destroyed for, we, we toughed it out for about a half hour caught. I don't even know how many fish, a bunch of fish. And then decided let's get out of here i can't take it anymore <laughs> but i do want to get back there some year i want to get back there and really explore that area because it wasn't a wide stream but it was a lot deeper than it looked and up right. there it's nothing like this water it's like coffee it's that uh, bog stained yep coffee water yep. and yep. the trout the brookies were pulling out of there were like dark purple yeah color it was yep. just it was insane man the, i mean it was Every cast. I mean, it literally was every cast. If you didn't catch one, it's because you messed up setting the hook or something. I mean, you got you got bit every cast within 20 yards of where you parked. I mean, it was unbelievable. It was it was a lot of fun. But um, this a good area. I mean, it seems like there's a fly shop here, so you get a fair amount of people traveling here to fish, or are these local new englanders coming up here um no it's well i mean travel is we're three hours from boston and we're three and a half hours from providence and we're four hours from hartford so the three biggest cities in new england you know you can make a weekend fishing trip out of this sure yeah and um you know that's that's pretty much what happens but yeah, we drove and, over from portland and it wasn't bad at all yeah we're like an hour and a half from yeah, portland yeah. so th there's a lot of um People that work in the city, live in the city or near the city and getting up to the White Mountains and getting away from all that stress and doing a little fishing, you know, this is the spot. So it's gorgeous out here. Yeah, it's um it's uh it's been awesome. It's been that way for as long as I can remember. Hmm. And um you know, that's why the shop's been able to last for fifty years. Yeah. You know, the the fishing's good but the people keep coming, so well, if fishing's good, they will they will keep coming. The scenery doesn't get any better. The water's clean and you've got thirty inch brown trout, so Right, right, <laughs> that, right. So that'll get people in here. That's that's our early season, April until Memorial Day. The uh the holdover Those brown holdover trout browns. drowns that uh, you know, go to thirty inches are in the river. Man. And uh you've got to cast seven weight, eight weight rods and you know, six, seven, eight inch long flies and yeah you know, they're not generally they're not sipping midges i mean right. these things are eat their mouth is as big as a pike i mean they're going to eat a smaller fish well the other thing that keeps them going is is the um you know once the state starts stalking the brook trout the hatchery brook trout and the hatchery rainbow trout and the hatchery brown trout you know usually eight to ten inches long those browns just feed on those fish all summer long I so bet. so you, you're tying up trout flies streamers right. that look like trout right if yeah, right exactly <laughs> exactly but the hard part is is that once those fish start getting focused on the hatchery fish they have no interest in your fly isn't it interesting how uh the fish the predators will they'll adapt to changes so whether it's you know, like you said and they and they probably know when it's going to happen or you know they're so keyed in on it like you said it, it probably doesn't matter if there's a giant mayfly hatch they're just keyed in on those you know, no, no. they're going to wait for the those brookies to start feeding on the on the bug hatch. Then they're going to run out and eat one or two of those while they're out, you know, exposing mm -hmm. themselves. Right. And one of the things that kind of helps our brown trout fishery is in New Hampshire, you, you can only fish for two hours after sunset. Mm. So a lot of places where people are used to fishing for big browns, they do it in the middle of the night with mouse patterns and sure. big gurglers and stuff like that. And you can't do that here. Mm. So well, that's a couple, the, that's couple hours another. anyways. Right, right. But it's, it's funny because even two hours after sunset, we're so far north, there's still a lot of ambient light. So it doesn't really get dark here in the summertime until about midnight. I want to say Minnesota's pretty similar. I think the 
I think you can't fish after 10 for trout. Anyways, I'm pretty sure, pretty sure that's the rule. It's like sunrise till, or is it sunrise? But I have to look at those regs. It's been a long time. Yeah, we're one hour before sunrise <laughs> that might and, be what and, it is. and two hours after sunset. That might be what it is. And that law goes back to back in the late 1800s to stop poaching, which is basically if they saw you with a fishing rod after two hours after sunset, you were getting the ticket. Sure. Well, so, that's one way to do it. So <laughs> made, it, made it pretty cut and dry. Yeah, yeah, that's one way to do it for sure. And isn't the limit out here like you don't have size restrictions on these streams no size there used to be a six inch size restriction and they took that off in the 70s who would even keep a six inch trout there's not that's like eating a smelt yeah well there's a lot of people that like to eat small brook trout so at one point they thought by making a six inch limit it would help however the biomass and all these upper streams that hold all these brook trout they don't grow brook trout bigger than you know you get yeah, a seven inch trout it's a trophy yeah and so, and they can be old fish too that doesn't I mean the size right. doesn't no it's not indicative to their age and that's yes yeah, the lack of food and then of course the coolness of the water their metabolism stays low so yep. they don't really pack on the pounds yeah right and they kind of grow to their environment yep. to an extent too yep. so it's they're interesting adaptable creatures but i was i was saying how they adapt like those to eat and they target and pattern those hatchery fish you know, Lake Erie when the when the um, those gobies got in there. You know, and the bass fishermen out there were you know before that were using you know alewife imitations and a lot of bait fish stuff and obviously crayfish stuff. And then these gobies took off, and then they were just eating gobies. <laughs> and you had to adjust and started modifying your jigs to make them look like gobies and then lure makers started making goby looking soft plastics <laughs> and then people started catching these smallmouth bass again it doesn't take long for those predators to figure out that they got an untapped resource and, oh exactly and once they key in on it it's like they don't want anything else well that's you know the browns with the hatchery brook trout yeah, yeah. you know they're gonna key right in on that and that's all they care about so wait till so if you're up here fishing just wait till they drop those <laughs> hatchery fish in and then break out the big big streamers well i I'll, I'll i'll give you a really funny story so one night we're coming back we're coming off the river and uh, we hear a big splash so we think maybe it's a uh rising trout so we walk over to the edge of the river and it's a beaver had it slapped its tail. Mm. So we're watching the beaver swim across the river, and then we see two little kits oh. <laughs> going behind the mother beaver, and then out from under this giant stump comes the 30-inch brown trout going after the baby beaver. Did he get one? <laughs> we didn't see him get one, but <laughs> I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have put it against him. <laughs> no, we'll lose a we, – we get a couple uh, muskies or big pike in Minnesota that will eat the um, – I'm sure they eat beaver kits, but they'll get the muskrats too. Anything, anything that, you know, that's what they do. They yep. eat one big meal and they're good for a while. That's what they want. Right, right, exactly. You know, they're not sipping little minnows and stuff no. like that. You catch yeah. them accidentally once in a while, but, yeah. And so somebody coming up here and target those things, like what what are they looking for? Your uh, deeper runs? and Yeah, yeah. We've in, in the sockle where it starts to get 30 feet wide, 40 feet wide, 50 feet wide, you know, every bend in the river over the years has accumulated, you know, large woody debris, stumps, trees, and stuff that have washed down the river. And there's a matrix in the bottom of all these pools that those big fish can hide in. Oh, and um, hard to get know, out. Right, right. So not not only is it not only is it hard to get the figure out the right size fly, but you have to get it down deep into these pools. And some of these pools are 12, 14 feet deep. Now water's moving. I mean, right. I fished out there today. I mean, right. that water's moving fast. Right. Like, how do you, I mean, what kind of weight? You showed me that your trout streamer yesterday, your brook trout streamer that you tied up. Right. And so what kind of weight is on that thing? I mean, do you add weight to it, or is that just what you have tied to it? Well, some of those fish skulls are pretty heavy. So I try to find the heaviest one I can. And then I'll wrap the hook with um, lead-free wire. Okay as fat as the opening is in the head. So you add all that extra weight to it. And then of course we throw like Orvis depth charge lines, 
which are the heaviest sink tip lines that you can get. And we're fishing very short leaders, like maybe four feet. Okay. So these fish aren't leader shy at all. And um, when we're doing the floats, you know, the best way to access all this water on our river is to do it as a float trip. You know, we'll literally land that stuff on the bank or right next to the bank to make the splash noise. Yep. And then just strip like crazy. Yeah, you're describing how you really get them to go where you hold the rod in your between your legs. Right, right, and you do and you do a double handed retrieve <laughs> just just to get that thing look like it's <laughs> fleeing for its life. <laughs> just get to run as fast as possible. That would be intense. Then what if it hooks up like that? How well, do you then well, set the well, hook? well, that's the problem. You have to know how to strip strike. So you're not, you're basically like so you're 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 doing hand over hand, and the minute you feel the strike, you whatever hands on there, you've got to yank it all the way, and then slowly release it and pick up your rod and from between just your. Let li- that line slip through your hands as and it then, runs back into all that timber. <laughs> oh, well, that's you know that's why we use the short leaders and you know sure, ten and ten, 10 twelve pound test because if the minute you hook that fish, you don't turn its head. Yeah. He owns you. Oh, a 30-pound brown <laughs> is a beast. I mean, yeah. that's a big fish. Yeah. I mean, that's, man, all muscle. I mean, they, they're going to go right back into that dark cave right where they came from. Like, oh, man. That would, <laughs> I had one. I had one. I, I rose one in Minnesota like that on a small stream, and it stopped my heart. <laughs> I was like, Whoa, I wasn't ex- I knew they were in there, but I was not really expecting to see one. And, man, I – I'm pretty sure my heart skipped a beat. That thing was huge, massive. And that charged me up for a while. I went back to that river quite a bit that year, and then uh, and I kind of even got away from that. I, I hit that river once last year, and apparently word was out because there was uh, multiple people down there. <laughs> it's not really a secret. I mean, I'm not going to say which river it is because it is close enough to the, the Twin Cities area that it could really get piss-pounded. If, but right. the people that know, know. I mean, right. that the people that are interested, they know it exists. Yeah. Right? Then yeah. They know. Well, and, part of what keeps the Saco, you know, keeps these fish in the Saco is it runs through all private land. So there's only like two or three public access places. Where you can get on it. And where you can get on it. And when you do get on it, you've got to get on it in a boat. You know, a, a very quickly it turns into unweightable water right along, yep. the, sh- yeah. right along the shore from all the you know, water events that we've had here in the last 10 years. It's not, it's not a nice gradual wade out into the river. You no. can just take two steps and be over your head. Yeah, I found <laughs> once, I found a spot today. The water looked really good, and it was a riffle area, and it was shallow, shallow enough to, like, I walked out there in my just my shoes. I didn't have waders. But it was just, you know, half shoe height. I got waterproof shoes on. But then, you know, you know how it is. That now, now that next spot up looks better, and then I want to try that spot and that spot. And then the water kept getting progressively deeper. And I could see where it was shallow, but I had to go to it slightly deeper over my ankle. I'm like, ah, screw it. Feet get wet, feet get wet. And I just went in. That water's cold. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Well, and that, that is a hard part of wading, even with waders, is the water here is so clear. Oh, it's crazy clear. You You have no idea where the bottom is. Yeah. It's you'll look you'll really look down clear. and see a big rock and think it's one step and you're over your head like that. <laughs> Man, yeah, it was that water is unbelievably clear. Like that was one as as I spent the day out there today, I just was like I just kept getting taken aback by how clean the water was. It's like, wow, this is well gorgeous. I mean, we're we're on the edge, we're on the eastern edge of the White Mountain National Forest which is 800,000 acres of protected land, including Mount Washington. So as all the snow melt is going on, it's not going through any development, yeah, any just, open land, any clear cut, any yeah. anything. So And I went up I went up by White or what Washington, Mount, Mount Washington. Washington, yep. And yeah, there's a lot of snow up there like you said and all that melt coming off there and then, you know, the banks are all moss and everything so it, that's not even dirtying the water like that's no. all getting filtered before it gets to the stream so it's just as clear as a river could possibly be yeah, absolutely it, gorgeous yeah I mean, it's, it's it's awesome it's it's oh it was it was something saw a bear today oh you did good little one good it was i think somebody's feeding him because he, he came running and it's what i would call a cub and then i kept going right away i'm like where's mom 
Okay. You know, like, <laughs> but it was across the river, so I didn't have to worry about it. But I kept looking, and Mom never showed herself, but I think he's kind of on his own. He was acting pretty nervous because he kept running up a tree and then back down. He'd go up on, like, a little picnic table and start eating. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then so then I heard a door open. He ran up a tree, came out with a bucket. He dumped something on the table, went back in the house, and he climbed back down. <laughs> so he's I, – I, you know, he's that must be his little pet. Trained, yeah, yeah, yeah. trained. He's got to figure it out. But I didn't. I never did see a bigger bear or, or mama or anything. So, oh, he might be on his own. He wasn't like super small cub, but he was. I uh, I bet he wasn't two two years oh, old. He's yeah. a pretty small bear. Got a decent picture of him though. That was pretty cool. Yeah, that we have a lot of bears in in the uh, forest here. Is there a season for bears? Oh yeah, in yep, yep. There is. It's a uh, fall season. And it's kind of staggered. You know, we still do bait for X amount of time, and I think there's a very short, I'd have to look it up, maybe one or two weeks where they where the dog guys can run dogs. Oh, the let them run dogs do. But um, like a lot of bear seasons here in the Northeast, after, after once deer season starts, you can still take a bear, but it's all incidental nobody stuff really, that people see yeah, while they're out deer hunting. Sure, nobody really thing. goes after them. That's yeah. kind of the same in the upper Midwest. So Minnesota, we have a fall season, and it's baiting. I mean, it's the only way you'd ever shoot a bear is with bait. I mean, you, the people that, you know, are anti-bear hunting, like, you just, you don't understand. <laughs> like, you can't sit in a tree stand on a game trail and hope to see a bear. Like, just, no, you'd never no. see one. And you would ne- it'd be so ineffective you'd have such a bear problem in no time without managing those numbers without bait. I mean, it, it, I know it's, it sounds like to some people that baiting and hunting, those two things, you know, don't seem fair, if you will. But I'm telling you, when it comes to bears anyways, it's not like deer. I mean, it's, it, if you didn't bait them, you wouldn't see them. I mean, any bears I've stumbled upon in the woods, like in the wilderness woods, no houses around, they take one look at you oh. and they're gone. They hear so. you. They smell you. They can smell better than a dog. Way better than a dog. They know. You're, yeah, they're, they're just. And they're gone. So they don't. They want nothing to do with people. Yeah, we actually New Hampshire. We've had to ex- either expand this. We've had to expand our seasons because we have so many bears and so much bear problem oh. with, you know, ripping bird feeders oh, down, I believe turning it. I mean, this guy here, he's feeding. He's feeding Yogi there. So the yo- the <laughs> local uh, the local farmers union here had a. Uh, Someone kept breaking into one of their storage bins, and they they couldn't figure it out, so they put up a game camera. It was a bear. It was coming <laughs> in every night. Would just take his claw, rip the corner of the of the metal of the metal door, crawl in, grab a twenty five pound bag of feed, drag it out, take it off. Wow, <laughs> they're smart. They're smart. They know they know what's up. Yeah. I got exposed to something that I didn't, when it comes to bears, that I had no idea was going on. We were out goose hunting in the fall, early season, September, when the bear season was going. And we were kind of parked in this field entrance, and the farmer came out and was like, oh, crap, I think he wants to get in this field. We, and we were, we were hunting the field across the way of different landowner. So we hurried out there to move our vehicles so he could get his tractor in there. And, um, and he's like, hey, you guys bear hunt? I'm like, not really. I mean, I have, but he's like, well, you can hunt my place. He's like, they're just killing my corn. I'm like, what? He's like, yeah. He's like, walk with me. So I, we went out in this cornfield and we stepped in like 12 rows. And then it was just like crop circles. Those big boars or the sows, they'll get in there and just like job of the hut. They'll just lay down. They'll pull that corn to them and just eat. And they'll just roll pull down, pull down, pull down, and just <laughs> and then when they run out of corn that they can reach, they'll just move a little bit and repeat. So they'll just, I mean, this spot he showed us was a 50-yard wow. circle of corn just laid down destroyed. I mean, just <laughs> destroyed. And he's like, and that's just one of dozens of spots like that in my field. And I was like, I had no idea. I had no idea that bears were a, a corn problem. But, yeah, they hit a certain – milk stage that corn does where the bears really oh where the sugar is the best yep, in it. and then they they just hit it some of the biggest bears get shot every year uh, from like farmers that have a tag when they're harvesting the corn 
I mean, allegedly, because that would be illegal. But right, right. <laughs> oddly enough, during the harvest, some, some big bears get shot. <laughs> Somehow. Yeah. yeah, no, I, I, I have a farmer friend over in Vermont, and that's how he gets his bear every year at the end, at the edge of his cornfield. Yeah. He, he just waits until, like you said, yeah. whatever the right time is, and they'll start hitting the field, and then he'll just set up a stand. And Wow. And I, some moose, there's some moose crossing signs on the roads out here. Is the moose population pretty good? Yeah, back, the moose started coming back into New Hampshire in the 70s, and in the 80s and 90s, there were moose like everywhere, and I, I literally mean everywhere. But um, with climate change going on, the ticks have started to move north. Okay. And um, we get huge winter kill of moose really? with ticks. Yeah, the um, you just get so laden with the ticks. Yeah, yeah. And they they be on um, dead moose carcasses. Um, Fish and game actually takes them. And counts the number of ticks, and it's upwards of a hundred thousand ticks a, a moose. Wow! Who gets the job of counting those? Oh things? yeah, well, a grad student <laughs> that wants to be a wildlife bo- wants to be a bo- what a horrible bo- job that would be. A hundred, you got to count a hundred thousand ticks. But it's crazy Good because night. once once those ticks really start working it, the moose will go to the trees to try to rub them off, and they rub off all their the fur, fur, and then th- it's not really the the ticks. You know, hosting off exposure. of them, it's the hypothermia from the exposure wow. that kills them. So we have a different. So, is there a hunting season for moose here for residents? There is, but I just read the other day at the height of our moose population, we would uh, sell 500 permits. We're down to 50 permits. Now. Okay. Well, Minnesota, we haven't had a moose hunt in a while. The numbers have gotten so low, and they had a big uh, study going on as was because we have wolves in minnesota oh right right so first off most people want to blame the wolves well wolves have been around i mean wolves and moose have been sharing the landscape long before we got here so i don't really think that's the problem i do find it interesting that one article before this other study was published they talked about moose mortality and nowhere in the article was were wolves mentioned like, and I was like, that seems a little disingenuous because we do have a large population of people in Minnesota that are wolf lovers. I mean, like, the wolf can do no wrong. They're, it's always man. It's always the evil person, you know. It's like that's not the case. I mean, wolves are like any other game species that, you know, should be managed I mean, if you want to say they need to be managed, but they, you know, if you're managing the other stuff and you're not managing them, it's going to get out of balance. So I found it interesting that they didn't, they didn't want to demonize the wolves. They just kind of conveniently left it out. I'm like, well, you can't leave it out. It's part, you know, right. You can't, you can't look me in the eye and tell me that moose predation isn't part of the, you know, the death toll. Maybe it's small. That's possible, but you got to at least include it. Right. Don't just right. omit it because it doesn't fit your narrative, you know. Um, but then what they found is that it's actually closer linked to the expansion of our white-tailed deer population. Oh, brain worm. Yep. That's yep. exactly what it is. Yep. So as we clear forests up there and agriculture and probably climate change and stuff moves further north, now these moose are getting in contact with these white-tailed deer that they never did before because that the northeast part of Minnesota was not really known for white-tailed deer. It's it's much like this. It's bog swamps and you know lakes, you know infertile Canadian Shield lakes. Uh, I mean, it's not. There's no corn. Right. You know, there's, right. you might find the. You might find a dairy farm here and there, a small outfit dairy farm and some hay fields. But other than that, it's wilderness. I mean, that's all Superior National Forest up there in the Bondi Waters Canoe Area. And so they've never been exposed to those white-tailed deer, and those white-tailed deer are spreading. Their, they're not susceptible to the brain worm, but they pass it, pass right. it on. Right, And then the moose, now the moose are foraging in the same areas as those white-tailed deer, and that whole life cycle, which I believe it's a snail or a slug, that that uh, facilitates that life cycle, that brainworm life cycle. They'll climb up onto a a leaf. The moose or deer inadvertently eats the, the whole thing. The thing, you know, just because it's eating the leaf, and then that 
parasite egg gotcha. gets in there, hatches out, completes the life cycle, and blah, you know, gets spit out and it's shit, and then you know the whole right. thing just keeps, keeps going. going and going and going. So I don't know what the answer to that is, other than what people don't want to hear, and that would be an intensive whitetail season. Like I think I think they should liberalize the hell out of that whitetail season in the northeast part of Minnesota and just try to knock those whitetail back as as much as they can. But that's not what the hunters up there want. They want those whitetail deer. They want they. Well, that's I mean, always the conflict amongst everything. I mean, I can remember before introducing turkeys was a big thing here in New England. You know, we had grouse. You guys might call them partridge. No, we call them grouse. Okay. I mean, the grouse hunting here, especially in New Hampshire and in Maine, was off the chart. I could go out every day and shoot two or three grouse. And then all of a sudden, turkeys were the in bird, and we started planting turkeys. And the turkeys are such efficient ground feeders oh, yeah. that they totally outcompete the grouse now. And our grouse hunting is terrible. Yeah, I don't know if that's the case in Minnesota. We have both, tur- and the turkeys have definitely expanded their range. They are, it seems like they're everywhere. Um, but we still have a pretty good grouse population. Um, I don't know. I'd have to dig into that a little more and see. If, I have heard that, that it can that it can hinder the grouse population. But I don't know if that's an anecdotal thing or if that's been backed up by studies. Or I'd have Yeah, to, I don't I'd know about the studies, but I'm, my, you know, my in-laws own an 80-acre farm. And, you know, like I said, the 70s and the 80s, I could always count on, on shooting a few grouse there. And I don't think I've seen a grouse there in 20 years. Really? You don't but hear them in the spring drumming? No, hmm. no, and we got, but they've got turkeys, man. Like, <laughs> like. Tur- I saw a few of them when I was driving <laughs> around here. Not too, not too many, but I have, I have seen a few. Is turkey hunting a pretty big deal? Oh yeah, going yeah, on right the now. Season's going on right now. Yeah, yeah. So I haven't seen anybody out hunting. I haven't seen any blinds or anything as I've been out and about. But I have no, seen some turkeys. Well, well, we do. We only have a morning. You can only hunt till noon. Oh okay. And. um at least around here, it's the guys that I know the turkey hunt. They'll they'll call and listen for the call back, and then they more still hunt than setting up oh, decoys okay. and blinds at the edge of fi- edges of fields. There's not that many fields in this neck of the woods that right. I've seen. There's a couple, right. but not very many. No, it's a lot of trees. Yeah. So yeah. So that makes sense. That would be, yeah, that would make sense. What? Well, so, what's the main? Is so a white tail a thing out here? I mean, I, I'm sure you have. I, fact, well, no, I know yeah, you no. have. Them. I saw the tracks down by the river, but how is the population? Is that a well here in the forest? You know, it, it's it's kind of stabilized into what it is. I mean, we have a a lot of big deer, relatively speaking, but numbers wise, we don't have a lot of deer. A lot of deer, but a if, lot of deer hunters. Is uh, it a, not a lot of deer hunters no? either. Most of our deer are. I know the the state's kind of split into a. You know, from here north is what I'll call big woods deer. Okay. And from here south, I'll call it farm deer. Oh, sure. And, you know, south south and west of here where we still have a lot of farms or we have, you know, suburban homes, you know, the deer population is like crazy. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they've, crazy. they've adapted to people about as good as anything ever has. I mean, we got them right in the cities. Yeah. They're everywhere. Yeah, yeah. You Turkeys know, the, do. And the coyotes. <laughs> Everything has moved. Coyotes, Fox, everything has moved right into the city. I mean, like downtown St. Right. Paul oh, has yeah. coyotes. Oh, yeah. Oh, like, yeah. It's, people don't realize. You know, they let the little Fifi out at night. and like, you might not want to do that. <laughs> there are plenty of videos and pictures, people's security cameras and that catching. Uh, I watched one. It was unbelievable. This coyote grabs this. It was either a cat or a small dog and scales this had to be it was all eight feet if not 10 foot security fence and just up and over i was like <laughs> wow like you think your dog is safe in there but it's not i mean no. it's it's unbelievable how athletic those things are and adaptable and opportunistic like right it's, it's right they don't all they see is something smaller than they are and that's food yep and it's yep. you know that's crazy it's it's unbelievable and then people don't think we have a, you know, then they don't want you to hunt them. But it's like, <laughs> well, 
until your dog goes missing. Then you'll probably change your tune. But well, I well I had a neighbor that was like that. You know, there was a uh, there was like an anti trapping thing that was going on, and you know she was all anti trapping. You know, what about my cat getting caught in someone's trap? Blah blah blah. But anyway, same thing happened. The trapping stopped. The coyotes got out of control, and all of a sudden her dog was missing. Yep. And uh, wow. all, all of a sudden she became pro trapping. Yeah, like she's like, well, hurry. maybe we <laughs> have too many. Maybe, maybe. Now that Fluffy's gone. Maybe, just maybe. Yeah, it's cr- it's it's nuts how people can be so rabid about a cause like anti-hunting or anti-trapping but know so little about any of it and then just wildlife in general. And that's kind of been one of my biggest – you know, everybody knows me has heard this rant like a million times, but <laughs> these people that live in these high rises and want to ban trapping and want to ban hunting and, you know, they, they just don't understand. And they call themselves an animal lover. It's like, how can you be an animal lover? You know nothing about them. You, they're cute. That's, that's all. That's, that's why you're an animal lover. That would be like me saying, I'm the world's biggest football fan. Because I think Tom Brady's cute. I don't know how the game is scored. <laughs> I don't know what position he plays. I don't even know what team he plays for. But he's cute. I love football. <laughs> I love football. No, you don't. You don't know anything about it. But a hunter or a trapper or a fisherman, they know they know where that thing sleeps. They know what it eats. They know when it breeds. They know when you know. They know everything about that animal, like everything. They know how it smells. I mean, when you right. when you when you kill one and you start gutting it out, I mean, they know they literally know what these th- makes these things tick inside and out. They're true animal lovers. They know what's they know what's going on, you know. And it's just ignorant people sitting in there behind their big well, screen it, TV, it all, just thinking that they're doing something for the world because they get emotional. It's like no, you're not doing anything. It, all, it always amazes me how fast. A gut pile disappears. Oh, nothing goes to waste. You know, so. There's always just that stomach stuff left. That, that what I've noticed, like everything else will disappear except for the contents and what was in the stomach, like on a deer gut pile. Like that's like not, that just rots. That just goes like <laughs> bugs don't even eat that. It seems like I'll, I'll go back in the spring and I'll still see some, still be there. Some fibers of it just kind of rotting into the dirt. Like, Nothing touches that, but everything else, gone. everything else is gone. Yeah. The crows, coyotes, possums, raccoons, they all take their share. And yeah, it's nothing goes to waste in nature, that's for sure. Yeah. I was going to say, when you were telling the story about the, the moose dying off here, I was thinking, boy, the bear must love that come spring. They come on a high oh, yeah. and they got oh yeah smorgasbord waiting for them. Well, it, well if the coyotes haven't eaten them, for, eaten them in the winter first. Yeah, I suppose. Have there been any crazy talks about reintroducing wolves out here? Um, Seems to be the new thing. I don't think you're introducing per se, but, if but they move where? In, they move but, in. But, yeah, but there have been more and more moose in Canada moving their way south. I'm mean, not moose, wolf, wolves in Canada taking advantage of the caribou and the moose population there. And the questions become, you know, especially with caribou where they're so cyclical, the populations, Mm -hmm. you know, where are those wolves going to go? And, you know, if we still had moose like we had 20 years ago, be pretty good odds that the wolves would be coming back down. Sure. Yeah. And I suppose you'd have to see what kind of corridors they have, travel corridors as far as getting from, I mean, how many populated areas would they? I mean, you got the Appalachian Trail. Right out your back door here. That goes all the way into Maine, so you would think they'd be able to get. Oh, they can get it. I mean, that's how the that's, they want. that's how the moose got here. The moose came here from Canada. I mean, back in the, I think it was. I want to say, in the forties, but I could be wrong. There were no moose in New Hampshire. Moose had been extirpated. Yeah, I'm pretty much in the lower forty-eight. Yeah, everywhere. Yeah, so. You know, back in the 70s, I remember seeing my first moose up in Pittsburgh, New Hampshire. And, you know, it was like it was like a thing. Hmm. And, uh, you know, they just they just took off as far as the population yeah, went. The, the conditions of, were right. A lot of parallels with New Hampshire and Minnesota. We're pretty close 
latitude wise i think we are yeah pretty close i think yeah. minnesota's a little further north but not much it's pretty everything seems pretty close except i think we've always had moose just being right there in canada right, right there and, and that like boundary waters canoe area is pretty inaccessible and there's no roads that go in there so i mean it, that helps you know for those back in the day the turn of century and those market hunters there was too hard right. for them to right to get in there and really do any damage so it's kind of a but yeah, now we're now they're dying because of some brain worm. I mean, it's, it's like, and then you go into North Dakota, which I didn't even know had moose, and they got a hunting season, moose hunting. Oh, season. I didn't know that I, either. That's interesting. I was out there goose hunting, and I it was one of those. What did I just see? My brain told me I saw a moose, but that can't possibly be what I saw. And I remember the day before was we were camping in this uh, abandoned farmstead, and I saw some giant tracks. I mean, again, at first I'm like, those look like moose tracks, but that was so, that reality was so far from my brain that I'm like, there must just be cows. Like, right. cow, there must just be some cows that were in here or whatever. And I just justified it as that. And then the next day we're driving and there comes a cow and her calf go trotting from one standing cornfield across the road right into another one. That was <laughs> What did I just see? What, <laughs> did I just see what I think I just saw? And then you talk to people about like, oh, yeah, we got moose. We got lots of moose out here. Like, what? how do you have moose? Nothing but agriculture land as far as you can see. And in Minnesota, we shut the season down for however long because – and then but, if if and when they ever do open, it's a, it's a once-in-a-lifetime hunt. If you draw it, that's – you'll never – Let's see, that just goes back to your adaptability thing. I mean, Mother Nature knows how to adapt, and yeah, but there's it's, plenty of food, plenty of food there. Well, and, and they have whitetails out there, too. So I don't know that relationship. Like, I'd love to talk to a wildlife biologist about it. Like, why is the brain a problem in Minnesota, but it's not a problem in North Dakota, which is our neighbor? Like, what is going on? I, I, do the, does that brain worm parasite not live in the Dakotas? I mean, is there some other element that they don't have that minnesota has i just don't understand why it's a problem i mean the state the states are so close i mean they're so close i mean they, they border <laughs> obviously but i mean from the furthest edge of minnesota to, to north dakota is you know three four hours it's not right it's not far at all no no what else so how about uh mountain lion to get any of those come travel through this well, way once that's more? that's the big debate that's the big debate. I bet, uh, I bet this is another Minnesota parallel. So, well, what I will tell you is back in the 70s, I ran a bait shop in Pittsburgh, the, our northernmost town, and it was before I had a driver's license, so I had to walk everywhere. So one morning I'm walking, and this is when the moose were first sure. coming back in to the to the township, and... I don't care what anybody says. When you see a mountain lion and you see that big long tail, <laughs> yeah. you know you saw a mountain lion. <laughs> I've never seen one in the wild. Uh, part of me would like to. The other part of me doesn't want to because <laughs> I saw a track once. We were out in Wyoming and didn't think anything out. We were just driving, and we saw this uh, waterfall way off in the distance. And we're like, well, let's hike up that waterfall. looks like a pretty easy hike. It's not, you know, let's – pull off here all right yeah let's go so we do that we're getting about halfway there and then in the sand this is big cat print and did like the pocket check like i don't have a pocket knife i don't have like my car keys the closest thing to a weapon i had I, we didn't even have bug spray as far as like maybe i could spray some off in its eyes or something you know like what right, I, right. I had nothing like i felt it's a weird feeling when the first time in your life you realize you're not the top predator. I mean, it, re like, right. it really is right. a paradigm shift in your existence. You're like, uh, I mean, I just came hyper aware of my surroundings. I started listening more intently, really scanning, you know, scan. I mean, that cat was long gone. Who knows when he made that track? Right. I mean, that could have been a week old track for all I know. I mean, but just knowing it was there <laughs> was all I needed to, to make me take notice. You know, I'm like, oh, my God, I'm, this is something different, you know. But coming from Minnesota where we do have them. So the parallel I was going to – the parallel I was going to draw is that there's a huge debate that every time somebody sees one in Minnesota, and we do, we get them on trail cameras. One got hit by a car a few years back. 
the DNR shot one probably eight or ten years ago in the South Metro area. Um, so they they come through, and we always get the same story that they're just young males traveling through looking for a territory. We don't have a breeding population of mountain lion in Minnesota. And then there's some old timers, you know, some backwoods hillbillies, rednecks that swear that, you know, but they also think the DNR is just out to get them. The DNR is just a big, it's a boogeyman as far as these people are concerned. Like they're just everything. Well, DNR our, can our, never do anything right. Our, our big deal here in New England, because they'll be mountain lions, like you said, that will just show up, get hit by a car or whatever. Our, our big line that we get fed here in New England is, oh, that was somebody's pet that they let go because they couldn't take care of it anymore. Oh, okay. That seems kind of unrealistic. <laughs> How many people have mountain lions for pets? Well, especially since if you <laughs> if you do have one, you better have a permit for right, it. Right? Yeah. You know, I mean, I know some people do have them, but I mean, and how? And if you take time to get a permit to have a mountain lion, you're just gonna let it loose. Like that, that does that seems unrealistic <laughs> right. as well, too. But I do remember a story, and I remember this because this cat had to have passed really close to where I was deer hunting while I was deer hunting within, and I mean relatively, within a mile or two of, of where I was sitting because it was first spotted in uh, like west of the cities and then it was spotted again. It was like moving east and then it was spotted in uh, the easternmost part and then all of a sudden it kept getting spotted in Wisconsin and, and eventually I believe it got hit by a car somewhere out here, like in New Jersey or some oh. shit. Like it it was just heading oh, yeah. for the East Coast yeah. for whatever reason. But it made quite the trek. But the night when the story broke and I was watching it, they're like, it was spotted here. And they kind of laid out the map of where it was spotted. And I'm like, I hunt right there. <laughs> and it was there yesterday and there today. Like, wow, that thing went right through your area. Right through my backyard. <laughs> I mean, not literally my backyard, but close enough that there was a – pretty good chance that it, you know i could have seen it and was sitting in my tree stand i would have that would have been cool like i would have that would be the perfect scenario to see a mountain lion in the wild i'm right. up in the tree stand it's doing its own thing i just stay still it's not gonna know i'm there that would be pretty cool right. i'd be i'd be right. totally okay with that <laughs> that would be pretty wicked to see that transpire but no it was pretty close but we that's what we get but i'm always kind of surprised because we have Big enough areas like that Boundary Water Canoe area, is that north that north shore of uh, Lake Superior is a lot like your mountains up here. I mean, the topography is is pretty similar. It's not as vast, right? So you got a lot of population right along the coast, but then just a little bit west, then the then the human population drops off pretty drastically, and then you got a pretty good chunk of land, and it's loaded with deer. So you would think. Any young cat moving through, right? Stumble on that, like why would you leave? Right. I mean, this is the perfect place. I mean, this it sets up just like the mountains. You got big rock outcroppings you can ambush deer from. Uh, but I don't. They they claim they say that we don't have a breeding population. And well, I, you know what part part I think part of the issue is is. Um, Within the last 10 years, the Canadian lynx have moved down into Maine. Well, lynx are an endangered species. Well, now all of a sudden the Maine Fish and Game Department's jumping through hoops, filling out paperwork. We have the same thing again. So same thing in Minnesota. We had, well, I'm, a- I, if, if there ever really was like a small population of mountain lions in New mm-hmm. Hampshire, I wouldn't tell anybody about it. Yeah, because it would Cause just- they have to. Down. They have to change the hunting regulations, sure. the seasons, the everything, so that these lynx don't accidentally get shot or trapped or whatever. Yeah, it, they changed the way. In in the part of the state in Minnesota that has lynx is known to have lynx, and it's that same area we've been talking about, that Boundary Waters Canoe area, that northeastern part of the state. So they didn't close down trapping, but they, the way you trap is different it has to be in a box like if you're using the conifer trap because a lot of people up there they'll trap for pine martin and fisher so we'll use the you know 
a box trap. But now it has to be like on a ramp, and there's all these different big overhangs. So basically, links can't get in there. It's, they're, they're making it so right, the links right. can't get in there and accidentally get caught. And um, but those you know little weasels can still get in there, and <laughs> can still snap them. But even those, their numbers have been declining and. Um, I think it's down to like a five-day season, though, trapping season for uh, Pine Martin and Fisher. So that's even getting restricted, too. Right, yeah, so. yeah. And that's just – there's one – there's that's just a line. The, the Highway 53 East, you got a trap like this. If you're across the road, you can trap however you want <laughs> within the regular laws, trapping laws of the right. statewide regulations. Or right, whatever. right. That's really interesting how the these two areas are – I mean, it, I guess it goes. Well, it's like you said. I think sense, we're, I think we're I think we're pretty much on the same. I guess I never really thought about it too much because where, I just thought you had more people. Where's the 45th parallel run through Minnesota? I have no idea on top uh, of my head, but because it runs, it's probably only 30 miles north of here. 40 miles north of here is the 45th parallel. Okay, it's probably the Twin Cities area. I mean, yeah. we looked at we looked at it on the map, and it wasn't. It's not that different. It's just slightly more north than where we're at right here. So, but I I was asking the the bear hunting thing because I know Jersey, it's banned, and they have like the most bears per square mile in lower forty eight right. than anybody. It's right. like, how does that get banned? I mean, that's got to be a massive problem for them. And how far is Jersey from here? Oh, uh, five or six hours. That's really not that far. It's really not. I mean that's pretty close. That's uh, is there? How is the? I don't re I don't really know much about what's going on sure. with the bears down there. No, yeah, I was gonna ask like, yeah. is there a is there a big pushback hunting pushback here? Is there a big no, no, hunting hunter no, in New Hampshire? No, I, um, I mean every once in a while HSUS Ugh. will try to get a you know a a bear baiting bear or whatever thing, and then there's another. You know, we have a coyote protection group that's constantly trying to get this. We we have no season on coyotes. Same. And, you know, you can hunt them 24 hours a day. Yeah, they're, so they're every pretty once much in a, deregulated. Yeah, every, so every, I've been going, I've been going to Fish and Game Commission meeting, commission meetings now for two or three years. And almost every meeting, somebody will get up and ask why we're not you know, protecting the coyotes. Because <laughs> they don't need it. <laughs> so. They literally don't. I mean, <laughs> back when they were when they extirpated the wolves, they meant to take the coyotes with them. They just couldn't. I mean, they just, all they ended up doing was spreading the population out. There's actually a really good, uh, there's a book called Coyote America by Dan Flores, and he goes, kind of breaks into it. And what coyotes do when they're heavily persecuted like that, like they just, they spread out and you actually, you end up with more coyotes in more places overall when you heavily persecute them like that. Yeah. I, I think I've seen a, I think I've seen a study that showed that if you do an intensive coyote removal program, they just actually breed more. They do. They, so, and they talk about this in the book too, like when they're doing their yipping and stuff at night and they're howling and their barks, part of that, you know, it's territory. Part of that, you know, it's breeding at certain times of year. But another part of it is they're basically taking like a roll call. And what these studies have found is that after the intensive, uh, you know, harvest of coyotes, that the following litters, they'll have more pups per litter. So there's some weird right. trigger mechanism that they know when their numbers are low and they need to pump out some new ones. I mean, you know, turn of the century, there were no coyotes east of the Mississippi. Right. And it wasn't until they tried to exterminate the wolves and, and the coyotes that they just kept pushing them out. Yeah, they pushed them out of the plains, but they pushed them up into the mountains. They pushed them north. They pushed them south. And they pushed them right out here, right back into the cities. <laughs> and now they're everywhere from coast to coast. They're down into Mexico, and they're starting to get up into the southern part of Alaska. I mean, they're well, it's highly interesting. adaptable. Yeah, it's interesting. But our whole, our whole influx of coyotes happened at the same time the moose population went up. Sure. So... Yeah, it's the coyotes don't need our protection. <laughs> well, <laughs> on, honest, doing just on, fine. On, honestly, if we ended up doing nothing with anything, let's just say we let's say all hunting got banned. It's already been proven. There'll be a big, huge surge in all these populations. Then there'll be another huge die off. Sure. And then mother mother nature always finds equilibrium. It would, but it would find an equilibrium with us as well. 
Correct. And the pro and the reason we, that we use we need to manage wildlife is because we're trying to live our same level of comfort and our luxurious lifestyle of air conditioning and uh, not having our pets killed by wildlife and not having our crops damaged by wildlife. Like we want to live this really posh lifestyle. <laughs> and if you want nature to take its course, you don't get to live that posh lifestyle. It just doesn't work like that. So you got to kind of make your concessions. If that's how you want to live, then we're going to have to, where we live, so manage life, life so, around us. So I'm far from a wildlife expert, so we'll bring this back around to something that I <laughs> yeah, know. Yeah, I'm not uh, either, but I mean, I, you know, <laughs> that I play I know, one on TV. That I know something about, <laughs> but I will tell you that after over 20 years of restoring brook trout habitat, that's exactly what we see. All of a sudden, the, the trout population goes ballistic. You know, there's no, it's catch and release or no harvest at all. Mm -hmm. You improve the habitat and the population goes like this. And then the population just flattens right out into the normal bell curve where you've got a lot of young of the year. And then you've maybe got, you Couple. know, four, four or five, five-year-old fish. Brook trout last about, live about five years. But it doesn't take very long for those fish to adapt to the habitat that they have and to reach their equilibrium. So, yeah. But if you were to, if you could wave a magic wand for your area here, what would you like to see? Would you like to keep the big 30 inch browns or would you like to see it return to four and five? Well, one brookies? of the goals that I'm working on with Trout Unlimited and, and Fish and Game is to stop stocking within the White Mountain National Forest. But that's going to raise, that's going to ruffle there, some feathers. Well, it, it's interesting because, um, you know, the, the three summers I've owned the shop, a lot of millennials, you know, the, the elusive millennials, yeah, the, yeah, the yeah, elusive sure. millennials, they don't want anything to do with stockfish. Hmm. They want to go up in the mountains and hold the real thing. Oh. And um, the Forest Service is, does has been doing constant temperature monitoring studies, you know, what, last 30, 40 years. And the wa any of the water above 2,500 feet, which, of course, we have a lot of water in the White Mountain National mm -hmm. Forest above 2,500 feet, hasn't been negatively affected temperature-wise. So we have these havens in the White Mountain National Forest where the brook trout are pristine. They, a lot of rivers, they've never been stocked over. You know, they're the actual yeah, strains from when the glaciers re yeah. receded. And um, believe it or not, we don't really do a lot of stocking in the forest, relatively speaking. So it's not a huge fix to try to turn the national forest into a wild brook trout sanctuary. And then down here in the river, you know, I was telling you the story about, you know, we started putting browns in mm -hmm. in the 50s. I don't know that there's a fix for that. There's, if there's, if you stop, are they reproducing, the browns? Yes. They are yes. naturally reproducing. Yes. Yeah, there's, I don't yeah. know how you would get them out then. No, they're in there, they're in there. And with, you know, with cli at least climate change the way it is now, with the number of flood events we get, if we were to spend a ton of money, like you said, you know, there's no, there's no mm -hmm. limits. If we spent however much money it took to create all this habitat in the river for brook trout, the next hurricane is going to just blow it down river anyway. Sure. So um, one of the things I always try to pre, no, I don't want to say preach. I'm not a <laughs> preacher. But one of the things I always say to people is, you know what, we have to all learn how to get along. There's people that want to go catch stock trout. There's people that want to catch brown trout, which technically are an invasive species. Technically. Um, so our why, why, why can't yeah why can't we why can't we come to an agreement that like I said the White Mountain National Forest is going to be all wild brook trout water, and outside of the forest, we'll you know have have it be a trout fishing park. Sure. Yeah. Put and take. You know. And. You know, one of the other things, you know, ending ending our fishing season October 15th is kind of foolish now with the way climate change is. 
you know, there's no reason that we shouldn't be able to, you know, fish 12 months out of the year. Well, and at least go to a catch and release. Right. Season. Catch, you know, yeah. I mean, if, if the quote unquote season closed October 15th because of natural spawning, then make a catch and release. But there are people that want to fish all year. They want to fish year round. And, you know, we don't allow that. So Yeah, we have kind of the similar thing. Again, very, very similar going on in, in Minnesota. Kind of the same thing. We, all of our fishing shuts down. Do you, like, do you have seasons on bass and stuff like that too? Or is that open year round? <laughs> there, it's all different. Yeah. It's so all. We have, we have every, almost everything except for panfish shuts down. Right. Panfish doesn't shut down. Yeah. So that's, again, there's another yeah. similarity between yeah. our two yeah. states. And then we have a big, it's. A huge event. In fact, it's next weekend is what we call the Minnesota opener. It's just called, it's not the fishing opener. We just say the opener. Everybody knows what we're talking about. And that's when walleye and Northern Pike, the season opens up again. Gotcha. And it's a huge thing. Because sometimes this is the only weekend some people fish. I mean, it's, it's a huge boom for resorts and bait shops and everything else. And I, I understand that aspect of it. But scientifically speaking, I think it's stupid. The walleyes are done spawning usually by this time. They spawn early, and so are the pike. But bass season doesn't open up. I think they change it now. The bass is open for catch and release until a certain, till like late May or the first week into June, and then bass opens. But when bass opens, there are – it's supposed to be protecting the spawning fish, but when the bass season finally opens for harvest – Northern two thirds of Minnesota, they're on the bed spawning. So, and unless right. unless you change your calendar structure to actually protect those spawning fish, you're not really doing anything. And then there's a rule. Then there's a, a rule. Uh, uh, not a rule. Uh, there's a school of thought out there, a theory that, and I kind of agree with this one. It doesn't matter when you take that fish out of any body of water that fish will never spawn again so yeah it spawned this year but if you take it out a week after it spawned it ain't spawning next year right so right. does it matter if you take that fish out a week after the spawn or a week before it spawns like it's the yeah, overall you might, you biomass is is it even affected by removing spawning fish i mean the the natural inclination would be, well, obviously it would, but does science back that up? Because when you're looking at just numbers and biomass, I, when you really start to think about it, I'm not sure that it does matter. I, I mean, it might be. Well, I mean. Unless it makes it more susceptible to catch, that would be one thing. Well, the, there's probably just as good of odds that an eagle or an osprey is going to pick that fish off than you did. Yeah, that's hard to say. I mean, you'd have uh -huh. to, again, it's just an idiot here talking so, about it. I'd have to so. talk to an actual fisheries biologist and, and see what they have to say. And then not a, not all waters are created equal, too, depending right. on forage and, right. and spawning habitat and, and what have you. So it's just... We've made a mess of Mille Lacs back home. It's just a nightmare <laughs> with the regulations and this, that, and the other thing. But we'll, we won't get into that. We've talked about that one enough. But how are things? Yeah, so so we were just talking about seasons. So chain pickerel, northern pike, walleye, perch, crappie, rock bass, carp, cusk. Cusk. Shad. What the hell is a cusk? Lake whitefish. No close season. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you don't have, um, really a lot of states don't have closed seasons on on a lot of their game fish. Yeah. Up in yeah. the upper Midwest, we do for whatever. Which reason. actually, I find I kind of find it interesting that Northern Pike doesn't because that's becoming a thing. The pickerel here, the Northern Pike. Oh, Northern Pike. Yeah. Okay. So that's what I should have went and targeted. I should have went to that pond. Yeah. Show me for pickerel. At least yeah. I could have. Chalk them off my <laughs> list. Catch a chain. I haven't caught a chain fish. What's a? How do you spell that? Cusk. I'm googling that. I want to look. Oh, C U S K. I've never even heard of that. Cusk so, fishing. So Maine. Cusk. I forget what member of the fish family a cusk is, but it looks like a. Uh, oh, it's like a cod. Yeah, it looks like a cod. Yeah, it's a member. It's of a ling. Cod. Yeah. Yep. North is a North Atlantic cod fish, like fish in the ling family. Huh. Is that a freshwater fish then? Yep. 
Yep, and we find it in our lakes, our cold water lakes. So it's a lot like we have um, a burbot or eel pot, we call it. And they're that they're like a freshwater cut. We call them poor man's lobster. And they're really see this is showing it that uh they must have some landlocked ones because this is saying that they're saltwater. Hmm. Yeah, no. Yeah, you probably have to put in freshwater cost. I'll have to I'm gonna do a little that'll be a nice rabbit hole I can go down to you later. <laughs> I like stuff like that. See when I I like to think I know a lot about fishing, and then I hear, like, never heard of that. I'm like, oh, going to have to do some homework now. But that's pretty good. Well, that fish is mostly caught ice fishing. Okay. Yeah, same with our eel pout. I wonder if they don't just call them. I wonder if it's the same fish. I'll have to look into that. Because, we, yeah, we have eel pout, burbot, and we catch that primarily in the wintertime. We have a festival in Walker, Minnesota, the eel pout festival. It's a giant oh, party. wow. Nobody really fishes. They drink beer and just get stupid but um yeah it's the whole festival built around this <laughs> that's funny <goose> slimy <laughs> ugly ugly ass fish but they are tasty i have eaten them and they're they are they do taste pretty good i actually wanted to do something this winter and i never targeted them to to make it happen but i was hoping they were in a lake i was fishing so it, it could have happened i just didn't but i wanted to catch one or two one Good size one or two smaller ones. Clean it up, uh, wash the carcass up good. Make actually reduce that to a stock, like a, a oh like okay a fish stock, yep, yep, and then make like a bisque, and then poach the meat, which is how usually most people eat uh, the burbot is poached. Then poach it, you know, in butter, and then add the meat, you know, after the bisque is already, you know, uh, so it would be like. Would be like a lobster bisque, but right. would be an eel pout bisque. I think it would taste pretty damn yeah, good. Yeah, that would be fine. If yeah. I could pull it off. And I wanted to do it on the ice, like in the ice house, make a video. It was going to be, you know, but so hopefully next year I can pull that one off. <laughs> I think it would be pretty good, though. Sounds, sounds yeah, good to sounds me. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, it sounds really good. <laughs> Although, I don't know if I can call it poor man's lobster now that I've had real lobster now that I'm out here oh. on the East Coast. Like, the lobster we get in our restaurants – in Minnesota, it's mostly West Coast stuff, right? I, I I don't know where it comes from, but I can tell you this: it does not taste the same. And no, I liked it back back then. But I remember talking to somebody who moved to Minnesota from Maine, and they're like, they refused to eat lobster out here because they had it, and they're like, it's disgusting. I'm like, why? It's not disgusting. It still tastes pretty good. And they're like, have you ever had fresh Maine lobster? I'm like, well, no, but how much better could it be? They're like, have it and then get back to me. <laughs> well, I've had it, and I completely agree. <laughs> <laughs> it's unbelievable how much better it is. Oh, but yeah. It's, yeah, it's totally – it's it's because it's cold water. Oh, it's the, just... the lobsters they get in the Midwest come from the West Coast, and they're in warm water. <sighs> they're not even close to the same thing. It's just – I don't even know how to describe it. It's, it's so good. I've eaten so much seafood. Since this is kind of this is our my anniversary trip. We go somewhere new every year, and so we we had never been to New England, so we decided to come out here, and it's just been a culinary adventure. I mean, went to the north end of Boston. Oh, there you go. Some good Italian food. Yep. And, and linguine and clam sauce, and oh my God, all sorts of clams. You know, the little foots and the this and that. I don't know. I've, I've ate so much food. I'm surprised I'm not forming a shell. I mean, just, I love it. It's so good. It's That's like, awesome. The food is great. Yeah. And then we went into Portland and then we had, and we hadn't yet, we'd had dishes with lobster in it, but we hadn't had just, you know, lobster where you're cracking the shell and doing the whole thing. And so we we're like, well, we kind of, we should do that. So we, the one night in Portland, we did that and that, ugh, God. So good. <laughs> it was so good. But then somebody, a uh, friend of ours, said that they prefer the lobster rolls over that. One, you don't have to mess with the cracking well, them open. Right. You know, it's just blah, blah, blah. So we went to, uh, is it, uh, what the heck is it called? Not, not Elizabeth Bay. What would they call it? The Cape Elizabeth. Cape Elizabeth. Thank you very much. That lighthouse out there, the Portland head light. Yep. Yep. And there's a food truck out there that has that does lobster rolls and we were somebody recommend a local recommended like you got to try that we had just had a big breakfast on the way out there i'm like well we should get one and we got one and 
I got to say, I don't know if I could say it's better than the whole lobster, but damn it, that was good. Uh, well, it's different. I mean, cold lobster and, and warm lobster. And, yeah, and, I did and say dipped, I, would, I think I still would have liked it warmed up because it's cold on the on the, the roll. Right. But it was like in this this roll was kind of like a Texas toast. Like, oh God, it was good. <laughs> <laughs> it was so good. So if people want to plan a vacation, I mean, uh, this is not a bad one to do. And like we already said, if you want to, if you're a big fly fisherman trout fishermen and you want to experience i didn't really realize till we came out here that new hampshire was a destination a fly fishing destination oh yeah a trout destination yeah. Yeah. and anywhere you can go and catch a 30 inch brown and have a realistic shot of 30 inch brown that's a destination in my book or or if or wild brook trout you know yeah. if, at catching actual wild brook trout is your thing you know this is the place to come and do it that's just awesome and you're hour and a half from portland you can right. get amazing seafood and fresh lobster right so you drive can do the out whole... do some fishing you know i'd recommend staying here right in uh what town are we in uh, <laughs> conway I right keep wanting north, to say conover north, i don't north, know why north north conway. conway that's why i get stuck up my my i think my friend in north carolina lives in a town called conover i think that's why it's stuck in my head conway north conway it's beautiful at the base of the white mountains pretty much and yeah, and if you want to plan, if you want to plan a trip, you can email me at shop at northcountryangler dot com, and we'll help you plan your trip. We do full guide service. Nice. So if you want to have a day on the water, you know you're you're from away and you don't want to spend a lot of time trying to figure it out on your own, we can get we can hook you up with guide service. As far as um, equipment goes, I've always uh, been curious about this. Do you rent waders? So or yep, yep. We rent do. waders. We rent boots. We rent we rent everything except flies. You got to buy your own flies. Sure. <laughs> and do you drift? Do you do you use drift boats or anything like that? Or uh, we use rafts. Okay. Because we have very sh- short period of time that the water's high enough that you can run a drift boat. A lot of times we've got to be able to have the raft to either f- go okay. over the shallow patches or be able to drag it over the okay. shallow patches sure. without you know getting a hernia. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Raft be a lot, a yeah. lot lighter than a. Yeah. They've yeah, been trying to get a, been trying to get a drift boat over yeah, it. So, for sure. and then you know if the wild brook trout is your thing. Um, we even have guides now that are certis- set, certified through the Forest Service oh, nice. to be able to take you up into the White Mountain National Forest and get you into some wild brook trout, nice. too. So. I always recommend people um, get guides, and not just because I- I'm a guide back in Minnesota, but ju- it's when I go to the Keys, I was just in the Keys a few weeks ago, we get a guide. I mean, we did a lot of DIY once we're down there, but the first day we were there, we got a guide to show us the waters, you know, what's where the bite is, where the bait is, right. hazards, you know, right. what, what to look out for. I mean, you can't really put a price tag on knowledge when it comes to stuff like that, especially if you're, you're, you're only there for a couple of days and you want to experience a certain style of outdoor activity. And I don't care if it's whitewater rafting or if it's fishing or it's hunting or whatever it is. You get somebody that knows the area. Because every area is slightly different. Because just like today, I mean, I was out there fishing. I didn't see a single fish, but I'm throwing an ultralight around with the tiny, you know, size one Panther Martin spinner for holdover browns that are 30 inches. It's not surprising I didn't see one. You know, I mean, they're, right, why, right. why would it, why, if it did eat it, I was screwed anyways. <laughs> yeah. I so know. I kind of thought maybe there'd be some smaller ones in there, but no, I was just, yeah. but the no. water's beautiful. I mean, yeah, that was, no, it wasn't no, a waste no. of a day. I enjoyed and, myself. And I think probably one other thing that I'll mention, you know, to your listeners are um, we're also a shopping mecca. So if you happen to have a spouse that's not into the fishing thing, we have day spas, we have shopping, we have, you know, all kinds of other activities. You know, you're not coming to a place where if you don't fish, you sit and read a book all day. No, and you're... Um, well, that's what my wife loves to do, and that's why we vacation well together. So while I'm fishing, she reads. So that, that's right <laughs> up her alley. But I do know what you're saying with the shopping, and as I've been driving around, um, I think they've done a great job at even the stores they have of keeping the feel, the architecture of the buildings. Mm-hmm, I mean, sure, mm-hmm. maybe it's still a TJ Maxx or whatever it is, but it lo- it fits in 
the architecture of the buildings, and you wouldn't think maybe that that would matter, but it does matter because it, it keeps that personality of the town right, I mean, and you, the era. You know, you, you're, you were mentioning New Jersey before. It's not New Jersey strip mall shopping. Yeah, it's not you know, it's an not, outlet, like right. big city outlet mall. It's, right, so. It's, re- it's a really, there's a lot of. A lot of character in this town. I mean, I'm not just saying that because I'm here talking to you. Like, we really enjoyed it. And we even said, like, we, we liked Portland when we went to Portland. Like, this is – we liked Portland more than we liked Boston. We're not yeah. big city people. The food in Boston was fantastic. Don't get me wrong. But it's a real city. But it's a real <laughs> city. Traffic sucks. And Portland had a much more comfortable, laid-back feel – but even then, once we got out here, we're like, oh, this is, <laughs> we should have spent more time out here. <laughs> like, this is more our speed, more, more our people. And I think we're hitting it right, too, for us, what we like to do on this vacation. It's because we like to meet the real people of a, of a certain area. Right, right. And this is off peak. There's not, you know, no. the, most of the ski resorts are shut down. I think they're all shut down, even though we saw people skiing today, hiking down the mountain, which is just bonkers to me that somebody's <laughs> willing to hike up a mountain just to ski on it and then hike all the way back that's a lot of work i think i'd hire somebody with a helicopter <laughs> screw all that but uh it's just so obviously the summertime resort oh, yeah you know, most of the motels yeah. say no vacancy because they're just closed you know so right the people that are here live here and we like that yeah i mean from memorial from memorial day to labor day you know there's a huge influx of people here for the hiking, for the swimming, a lot of people f- tube and kayak the river. So there is a giant influx of people in the summertime, but not so much fishermen. And what's the so. good time for people? Like if they want, well, if somebody wanted one of those 30 inch browns, what's their best bet? What time? You want to come in April until Memorial Day. And then at Memorial Day, the state starts stocking the river and the big browns are just eating stock trout. So. So the they, they, they following could, Memorial Day. Yeah, after Memorial Day, <laughs> you you'll see the big browns in the river. You won't even get them to move. Oh, they're just full, <laughs> fat, yeah. and happy. happy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yep, fat and happy. Like we all want to be. That's cool. And you do do you do um, like fly tying classes or anything like that? We do fly tying class. We well, I do private lessons any time of the year. In the winter, from November till our ponds open in April. We have free fly tying every Saturday morning. Oh, that's cool. And if you happen to be from out of town and you just want to tie some flies, didn't bring your stuff, you know, we have equipment that, you know, you can use that day. Oh, that's so you very don't, cool. So you don't have to feel like, oh, shoot, I didn't bring my stuff. I yeah, missed yeah. it. Yeah, Oh, and, that's very uh, cool. Because I, I even dabbled. I have stuck my toes into the waters of fly tying way back when I was in the fly fishing more than I am now, too. And I loved it. I didn't get too crazy with it. I did, like, some woolly buggers and some pretty easy things to whip up but there's definitely a satisfaction of catching fish on your exactly fly. like it's exactly. a lot more than one you bought off the shelf or somebody else tied and i'm going to kind of experience that same thing this year because i got cabin fever real bad and i broke down and i bought a bunch of uh, bass jig building supplies oh, yep, down yep, to the lead yep. melting pot and the mold and the whole the, all of it and I dorked out and I made like 150 jigs. Like, oh, wow. It took a while. But I'm good. I'm set now. There you are. You're I'm ready. Set. I'm set for at least with three eighth ounce jigs. I'm not going to run out this year. Last year <laughs> I did run out. Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, we we're it was a week long family vacation up uh, northern Minnesota. And that's what they were chomping on with these three eighth ounce jigs. And we ran out and the local bait shop didn't carry them because this uh. lake is phenomenal for bass fishing, but that's not what most people fish for up there. They fish for walleyes and panfish, and they're just, you know, it's families. They stay in the resorts. They're not hardcore fishermen. This is like the one time a year they fish, you know, so they go out there with a bobber and a worm and whatever bites, bites, and whatever, you know, doesn't, doesn't. Meanwhile, I'm out there in the bass boat, and I'm <laughs> picking apart cover and doing this, that, and the other thing. So the bait shop isn't really stocked up for that style right. of fishing. So I was SOL. I mean, I just, I was like, what am I going to do? <laughs> I got three days left in this trip, and I don't have any jigs out. left. This is what they're eating. Like, this is not good. So this year, we're good. Ah, we got a hundred of them to burn through. So. Excellent. But that's pretty cool. So you come up to Conway, North Conway, New Hampshire, 
And you got to stop. Find it. the find the North Country angler, and we will get you a guide, or we'll do our best to point you in the right direction and make sure that. That's a great little shop. It really is. You have a you have a good fishing trip. Yeah, the your fly boxes there. Do you tie all those? Oh no, no, I could, I could never. <laughs> I know, I could, I, yeah, I could, I could never. That keep would up be with your full time flying. job, right, right. <laughs> no, I know he didn't. I was just I had to throw that out. Well, there. but but you know there are certain patterns that you know because they're localized. Well, your you know, brook I, trout I, streamer I pattern. Yep, my brook trout streamer pattern, uh, mop flies, uh, alder flies. I mean, there's a bunch of flies that I do have to tie because. There's not enough volume in them for a for a uh, well, and they probably manufacturer to do it. Yeah, they wouldn't work other places. And right. That's what I was kind of right. getting to with hiring a guide or at least stopping into a place like this and getting the local information because just because maybe you wherever you live, maybe it's Minnesota and you're you know you kill them on this particular fly out there and you're going to bring that back back here and like I'm going to use my old trusty there's a high probability it's not going to work. Right. I mean, yes, right. it's the same fish. It's the same style of fishing, but everything is just slightly different. The food base could be different. Like I said, just the way they stock and the way those browns, those holdover browns adjust to that stocking is unique. Something I've never really heard of anywhere else. So it makes complete sense that, you know, so that's getting that real time knowledge is just, you can't beat it. It's just, it's worth it. And sometimes some people get sticker shock when they see like a guide fee, but I'm telling you, it's worth it. You're going to enjoy it. You're going to actually catch fish. You're going to be like me today went out and DIY'd it and I didn't catch a damn thing. You know, it's, but I mean, I like doing that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, yeah, I just like yeah, being in the area. Yeah, I, yeah, I don't, if yeah. I didn't catch something, that's fine, but um, that makes sense in hindsight. Well, I mean, the one thing I'm sure you fish for big fish long enough to know that you will hire a guide, you will fish all day. You will probably see three fish, hook one, and half the time you'll land it, and half the time you yeah, won't. and that's probably so, being generous. So that's I mean, you know that's the deal when you're going after yeah. those big fish. Well, I've come from a state that's heavy in the musky fishing, so that's the, yeah, the okay. fishing all so day you know. and not catching. That's yeah, just so what you know. it is, <laughs> especially when you're going for a trophy fish. A trophy yeah. fish, you know, it's there was a show called you know the hunt for the one. Like it's not you're not. Going out there and expect 20, 30, 40, 50 fish day, you get a fish that is uber successful. If you rise a fish, that's a success, you know. And then right. there's still going to be days you're not going to, I mean, whether it's weather or whatever, who knows, that some days I don't care who you are, you're just not going to get those fish to move. And that's just being realistic. And we've, we've talked about that with other guides I've had on this podcast about being really honest with um, that client guide conversation needs to be really open and really honest like oh yeah we we, get we their have expectations in line to where it's realistic you know you do want to get them excited but you don't want to give them false hope either and then they need to be honest with their skill level so that you as the guide know what you need to do because i i like to when i when we charter a boat or we do something i am a serial diy kind of person so i'm hiring you for your equipment and your knowledge for what's going on right now. I want you to show me what we're doing and then get out of the way, <laughs> 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 which is really hard for a lot of guides. And I get it because they're, they're probably, they're used to not probably, I know they are. They're used to people saying, Oh yeah, I fish all the time. I know what I'm doing. And then somebody has got a hook in their face or they're blowing up reels because they don't really know how to cast. And I mean, I, I get the trepidation that a lot of guides will have, but um, that's why when we hire out, we just, I like to talk to them face to face. Here's where I'm at. Here's what I am hoping for. You know, your tip is dependent, not on how many fish we catch, but how much you learn, how much I learn, how much, how, how much of the reins I get to take. Like, you know, obviously if we're deep water fishing for Marlin or something, I'm not going to be driving your boat. Like I've never ran kites in my life. I'm, you know, I might like to try it for 15 minutes, but then I'm going to sit back and let you do it. But if it's something that's, I feel like I can grasp the concept of, yeah, I want to do it. I want to tie the hook. Show me how to tie that knot. Show me a bim bimini twist. I want to, you know, let's, I'm, I'm about learning and experiencing new things. So that's, that's awesome. kind of how I like to do it. But I know a lot of people don't have time for that. They, they want, you know, it's a 
Oh yeah, I mean, oh, I mean, it's it's totally an individualized thing, and you know, we talk about it amongst ourselves all the time that you know people have a vision when they're hiring a guide; they have a vision of what their day is going to be. So we make sure that we fully understand what the vision is, and then we deliver on the vision. So the vision might be, I want to catch a fish every cast. Well, if that's the vision. We're taking you to some little brook trout stream, right? So you can catch a fish on every cast. If your vision is, I want to, you know, catch a big brown trout. Well, we're going to tell you that you're going to see three fish. You're going to hook one, and you're probably going to lose it. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> right. but but we're going to make sure that you know but we you make can't that catch happen it for you unless you get those other things in order. Like, yeah, you might catch it. Yeah, you might not. But there's zero chance you're going to catch one if you're fishing those brook trout waters. Like, so you have to Correct. pick your poison and what do you want out of it? Right. So we're not, we're not a guide service that says, you know, we, we fish the Saco and then we take you to the Saco and you fish the way we want you to fish on the Saco. That's not what we do here. We, we do, we deliver on what you, you try to get the experience that you want out, want of, it. out yeah. of it. And that's, so. that's kind of my philosophy too. It's like, I want people to come to Minnesota and. Uh, or maybe they live in Minnesota and they just don't get to fish. It's like, what do you want to do? You know, what what in your wildest dreams, what are you hoping for? We'll start there, and then I'll tell you if those are realistic or not. And if if I'm not the person that can deliver on that, I know somebody that is. If that's really what you want, well, see, and, and I'm going to put you in, the, in touch, and I don't care if I'm making a dollar on it or not. Like, I want you to come back to Minnesota, you know, and – just like you, you're going to want people to come back exactly. to New Hampshire and, and fish so that's, here. So that's why, that's why this year we added a bass guide because there were enough people that were coming in that want, even though this is kind of a trout mecca, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, we have big lakes that have big bass. We have a, a river north of here called the Androscoggin River that is world-class smallmouth fishing. Huh. And so How far we, of a drive was that? About 45 minutes. Good thing you didn't tell me that yesterday. Well, Guess that where I would have been. That river's blown out, though. <laughs> oh, is it? <laughs> <laughs> it's like every river back home. You think you saw a lot of snow in the woods yeah. here? About an hour north of here. Is they're it? still looking uh, at it like two and three feet in the woods. So no, I, I still would have went trout fishing. I can catch smallmouth back home. We got a lot of good trophy smallmouth waters in Minnesota. But that's, you know, that's the kind of thing that we do because, you know, everybody – like I said, has a vision of what coming to the White Mountains is, and we want to make sure that, you know, you get that vision. Yeah, well, that's a good place. To give people your email address again. So the email is shop at northcountryangler.com. We also have a website, northcountryangler.com, where you can get most of the equipment we have here at the shop. You can book a guided trip there if you can't get a hold of me on the phone and then we'll get in touch with you and get you do all any details social media out. Um, Facebook, Instagram, our, yep, any yep, yep. North Country Angler Fly Shop is our Facebook page, Instagram uh, we're Angler North Country Ooh, it, because there must have been enough there must have been, yeah, yeah. been taken yep. by the time we got an Instagram yep. page going and um, starting Memorial Day weekend I do a weekly Mount Washington Valley fishing report Okay. To let everybody know what's happening up here. And I'll try this. This episode will be released. I could probably look at the date. Let's see. It'll be a week from this Thursday, whatever date that is. Okay. So kind of right before Memorial Day. So Perfect. Be ninth, 16th, this episode will air. And then I'll try to get, I'll try to get links to all your, okay. your stuff so people can hopefully get to it access it easier yeah and, and if you need a if you need a picture or something to put up uh for your podcast or whatever if, if you want one let me know and i'll send you yeah, send a picture me. of the shop logo yeah, whatever that's fine whatever you want usually i just i just uh poach something off of facebook oh that's, <laughs> that's what i have been doing that, that's fine too that's fine too <laughs> grab something but yeah real quick before we sign off here is that you're working on a book right can we talk about that is that something oh yeah okay. no 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 um history pre i Yes. Yeah, you, 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 you might you might have to edit this, but um, it's the company that does the books, the history of you know certain you know the history of North Conway, the history of Minnesota, okay. Okay. of Minneapolis. Yep. That company now is coming out with a series of books called Fly Fishing Secret Waters, and so they asked me to do a book on fly fishing New Hampshire secret waters. Uh, 
that I will have that book off to them this week. And sometime, I'm guessing in the fall, they'll be releasing the book on fly fishing New Hampshire's secret waters. And I will tell you that the waters that are in that book, well, nothing's a secret anymore <laughs> with, you know, GPS sure, and Google Maps right, and right. everything. Um, I made sure that I did not put any snippets of any remotely popular waters in there. Every water that you find in there, you have a good chance of hiking into that water and not seeing another person. Oh, dude, that's right up my alley. That's what I like. That's that's right up my alley. Yeah. I'll, I will, I've done this. I'll hike two miles into a, a duck swamp somewhere, not knowing if there's a single bird anywhere around, just so I can hunt by myself. Yeah, yeah we we've got we've got some ponds in there that are five miles into the into the national forest. Oh, beautiful! And um, put a float tube on your back. Oh man! And your four weight rod in your pack, huh. and, and go ha go now have the time of your life. <laughs> not go back. I want to go do this now. I might have to come back. But we, yeah, well, maybe we'll come back because we we only touched Maine. I kind of want to do like another trip someday. We're gonna do like northern Maine, but I could definitely see myself swinging back down around this area is beautiful it's absolutely gorgeous and i need to explore it some more I didn't, sounds I great have a couple days so i don't know i might fish tomorrow morning but there's a strong chance i'm gonna sleep in uh, oh, maybe i'll catch that jane pick girl i don't know we'll see. <laughs> all right thanks steve i appreciate it all right thanks for having me yeah, bye bye